Apple's biggest software event of the year is just a few days away. Get excited, get hyped, and get your expectations in check. Don't get too hyped, okay? Relax a little bit. This is gonna be a huge disappointment. So to help get your expectations in check, we could talk about some last minute leaks that we heard from Bloomberg and what I'm most excited for in this event. Let's begin. So first of all, iOS is likely to be a pretty big star of the show because lots of us have iPhones. The biggest question I've seen floating around, especially during our live streams, is exactly what devices are going to get the new features, whether it be, sounds like, updated lock screen design, maybe some changes to the widgets, redesigned notification system, and food tracking, and you'll be able to put your phone in kind of different modes of, like, sleep mode or work mode. It's interesting because there haven't really been a ton of leaks for iOS 15 as a whole outside of some basic health updates. Updates. Apple is heavily alluding to messages being updated in some way, shape, or form. I'm not exactly sure how. Siri, of course, can always get better, so I'd be very grateful if they did any kind of improvement with Siri, whether it be the animation or her actual responses. But my prediction here is actually that when it comes to iPhones, Apple is going to require an A10 chip or better. iPhone 6 stopped at iOS 12, and as usual, if you go back throughout iPhone's history, typically the S year will end up getting two more years of software updates. And the iPhone 6s got iOS 13 and iOS 14, so it's gotten two years more than the 6, which means that if history repeats itself, you will need an iPhone 7, basically, or newer, to be able to upgrade to iOS 15. And I would love to be wrong here. If Apple actually does get iOS 15 to the younger iPhones, that would be wonderful, but I'm just trying to keep expectations realistic on what Apple has done in the past. It's also totally possible that iOS 15 might be so minor and might be so incremental that maybe optimizing it for the 6 success won't be that common, but yes, that does mean the first generation SE is probably not going to quite make it to iOS 15. Success and success plus owners out there, I know you loved your headphone jack, and I'm sorry that you might be not getting these new features, but hey, iOS 14 is not a bad update to end on. I think iOS 15 probably won't have too many features that you'll be sad you're missing out on, so just keep using your success until you're ready to upgrade. However, I think it might be a little bit different when it comes to iPadOS, and you're prior, we have seen Apple provide software updates to iPads that had similar silicon to iPhones that were getting discontinued and not updated anymore. So I actually think the iPad 5 that came out in 2017, even though it has the A9 chip, it'll probably still get iPad OS just because it's so recent and Apple seems to like making sure they keep updating devices after a certain number of years and that iPad 5 is really not terribly old yet. iPhone 6s, okay, look, you got six years of updates. I think that's pretty good. But iPad 5, if they discontinue that, this year, that means they only got like four years of support, which is not great. So I'm predicting the A9 chip for iPads and above to still be getting the latest iPad OS, though gotta say, out of the Bloomberg report where they talked about what we should expect with iPad OS 15, not looking too good. As you guys know, I think this needs to be the main focus of the event because I don't have a ton of thoughts on how they need to change Mac OS, mostly just how you interact with notifications and a few minor tweaks here and there would be nice, but overall it's still pretty capable. IPad iPadOS, though, is this huge limiting factor for the insane hardware that the M1 iPad Pro has equipped in it. The fact that Apple is selling, like, two and a half thousand dollar, 16 gigs of RAM, two terabyte SSD iPad Pros, and you can't really do much to take advantage of the silicon inside of that. I wish iPadOS could get a whole bunch of features over from macOS to make it more of a laptop replacement. This hits really, really close to me because I love the iPad hardware. It's still my favorite Apple product, and iPadOS just prevents it from being a back replacement so many times and while it's very unlikely that they will allow you to dual boot it into Mac OS or I've seen many people suggesting that when you dock your iPad with an external monitor then it boots into Mac OS that way. I don't think that's going to happen though I would love to see it happen mainly because these Bloomberg leaks are basically just saying okay widgets can now go anywhere on the iPad home screen. Yay you got a feature our iPhone had a year ago and they also referenced the notification animations might be a little bit different which I guess I'm somewhat interested to see. You know, I thought on the iPad it would make more sense to make it more Mac-like and let the notifications come aside from the top left corner just because, you know, that's where our battery and icons are up there and a lot of the time we're using our iPad in landscape mode. So having it come out from the side would be smart and Bloomberg didn't go into too much detail, but they did say there would be updated multitasking capability. So I'm hoping that because there's 8 and 16 gigs of RAM on the newest iPad Pros, they're gonna do something with that and hopefully allow 
allow us to have resizable windows that can be floating. It's crazy to me that it's been like 11 years and the iPad still doesn't have a calculator app. I've heard all your stupid explanations as to why they think the iPad doesn't need the weather calculator app. It's dumb, they should just throw it on there. But even that would really not exactly make it a laptop replacement for those who still can't transition yet. And because the silicon and the hardware is so good in there, I'm just so upset that iPadOS has to be the limiting factor so many times. So I'm hoping for a little bit better than food tracking, Mr. Federighi, okay? Please, let iPadOS take up the most amount of time because the hardware here is fantastic. I think out of all the Apple products that they've made, iPad Pro with its mini LED display that's 120 hertz with Face ID that works in multiple directions, and it's got the Thunderbolt port now, it's got LiDAR, it's got center stage, which is amazingly fun. I hate just that iPadOS stops it from doing so many things, but I am mentally prepared for disappointment. Now, the interesting leak we actually saw pretty recently was from Apple. It was in a job application posting where they referenced something we hadn't seen before called Home OS. And I'm by no means the first person to suggest this, but as soon as I read Home OS, it instantly made sense to me that Apple is probably thinking about combining the Apple TV and HomePod operating systems into one kind of platform. Yes, the HomePod runs a heavily, heavily modified version of tvOS, but that's because it's used as kind of a smart home hub for your devices, and internally the HomePod is kind of referred to as running audio OS, but because tvOS itself, in my opinion, is very basic, I mean, you've got like your essential home screen, you've got some media player controls, but essentially that's it. There's not really much else to third-party applications, which are usually just basic games, and there's not a lot of productivity apps on there, so tvOS itself is very minimal, and then it has to be really tinkered down and scaled down to fit on an audio product like the HomePod, and if both of these devices act as hubs for your smart bulbs and stuff, kind of makes sense for Apple to, instead of saying the HomePod runs, I don't know, some kind of weird OS, instead, just saying that, okay, HomePod and Apple TV run Home OS, and that helps you maintain your home, and Apple wants the Apple TV to be more than just a TV, right? It's your hub for photos and music and fitness plus. This is the home command station for everything that goes on within your house, so they're gonna keep the name Apple TV because that's what it plugs into, but ultimately the platform it runs, I could very easily see being Home OS, and I could end up being wrong. Apple did remove mention of Home OS once articles started reporting on it, and they changed it to instead say tvOS and HomePod products, and the fact that they had to replace Home OS with tvOS and HomePod products makes me think, okay, that's what Home OS is gonna be targeted for. Someone in the job application department just didn't get the memo. They didn't realize they weren't supposed to write that down yet, so this video could age horribly, but still, I think that's what we're gonna find out about on Monday, and now there will be a whole platform just for HomePod and TV, so we can get excited for a HomePod updates. And I hope the original HomePod still gets Home OS. I know it has the A8 chip, and it's pretty old, and Apple is no longer making it, and they're pretty much just selling the HomePod Mini, but they were selling the original HomePod not too long ago, and Apple likes providing many, many years of updates and stuff. So I'm really hoping that even my old HomePod can get HomeOS and we can play around with it and stuff, but it makes sense for them to kind of simplify naming. I'm all in favor of whatever results in less syllables, so I'm not in favor of having iPhone OS because that sounds more complicated than iOS. And HomeOS kind of rolls off the tongue to me a little bit better than TVOS or Audio OS. So if you want to just combine them so that there's less syllables and we can just say HomeOS, good for me, I'll take it. But of course, I know what most of us are excited for and what most of us want to talk about at this event because there's been Wedbush alluding to this happening, Morgan Stanley alluding to this happening, Bloomberg and Prosser. There's all these people talking about new MacBooks coming out at this event. We didn't get any hardware at last year's event and I was kind of doubtful we'd get hardware this year just because we already got so many in April but it seems like a lot of different news agencies are all kind of seeing the same thing and they're all talking about the redesigned MacBook Pros to be unveiled at this event. It's very possible they might not be able to ship until late July or even later in the year, but these MacBook Pros have a lot of interesting hardware developments for them. A lot of Apple going backwards on things. So for one, most of the reports we've seen about the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros have said that they won't include a touch bar and that they would bring back the HDMI port, the MagSafe connector, and the SD card slot, which definitely doesn't sound like Apple, but with so many people alluding to this happening, it sounds kind of believable to me. Sort of like how Apple went back on the butterfly keyboard and realized, 
you know what? We should probably stop making this unreliable keyboard. They're probably hearing what a lot of people are complaining about with the touch bar and people wanting legacy ports and that kind of thing. I'm in love with the touch bar, so I'm actually going to be pretty sad if they take it away. I don't get to use it on a regular basis, but whenever I had a MacBook, I love using the touch bar, but I totally get why Apple wants to remove it. So many people don't like it, and I'm just kind of a sheepish Apple fanboy, so of course I'm going to want them to keep it around. But I would just add, if at checkout they let you add the touch bar for $300, I would be the type of guy to pay that type of money just for the little display at the top, because sliding volume and brightness more dynamically and being able to control it depending on what apps you're in. I'm a big fan. I'm going to be sad when it goes away, but I've been living without it for a few years now, so I've kind of come to terms that it might not stick around. SD card slot coming back, though, I could see a lot of people being happy with. I've kind of already spent money on dongles and adapters, so I don't really care too much. I mean, the videos I record record to CFast cards, so I got to use an adapter anyway, so I don't care that it comes back. But for new buyers or people who haven't had a recent generation MacBook in a while, they don't want to have to buy a bunch of adapters and dongles with SD card slots in them and everything. So Apple bringing that back, you know, it's a win for most. HDMI, I feel a little bit weird with because I feel like Thunderbolt and Type-C is better because you can, I mean, charge the MacBook and output a very high video resolution through a single port, but most TVs have still not made that switch to Thunderbolt, and if they haven't done it in the past five years, they likely aren't going to anytime soon. So similar to keeping HDMI around on the Mac Mini, I guess it makes sense to also bring it back to the MacBook, and I'm not insanely excited that we might not have four Thunderbolt ports on these machines, but I guess if you don't have to use an adapter for HDMI and SD cards, many people probably won't need as many Thunderbolt ports as before, but I don't care. I still like having four, and I wish they would keep four around, and how they incorporate MagSafe into these things back again will be very interesting, because I love charging my Macs from the left or the right side, and as long as I can still do that, I guess I'm happy, but if they include MagSafe with the MacBooks, then that might be the only way to charge them. And some people like MagSafe, but I just fell in love with USB-C, being able to charge from either side. That's the way I like it, and even if they make me buy additional hardware for that, that's fine. As long as there's more charging options that people can appreciate. This MacBook Pro sounds like the godsend for a ton of Apple fans out there. But of course, the most exciting part of this next generation MacBook Pro isn't mini LED or legacy ports or keyboards or even 1080p webcams, although that would be great. It all comes down to M1X. I'll be very personally annoyed if Apple just decides to go with the M1 again for the 14-inch MacBook Pro, and that's all we see on Monday. And they're just like, yeah, M1 is still plenty fast. You don't need any faster than that. We already got that base model M1 MacBook Pro, and I guess Apple could try to upsell people just on legacy ports and thinner bezels, but I think it would make a whole lot more sense for them to actually equip higher performance chips in here, which Bloomberg has said will have eight high performance cores instead of four, and that's going to have just groundbreaking performance, better Apple Silicon than we've ever seen before, and knowing that those Geekbench tests could only be a couple weeks away, and those export times could be right around the corner, gets me really, really pumped. As a desktop user, I would be super duper interested in an M1X Mac Mini if that ends up happening because I love Apple Silicon and I want to switch away from Intel, but the M1 still can't outperform my iMac Pro in multi-core just yet. So M1X might be the first time that happens. And knowing how affordable those machines are likely going to be, I expect these MacBook Pros to start at the same prices of the MacBooks they're replacing. Same thing with the M1X Mac Mini. I think it'll be like $1,100 starting and you'll get an insane amount of performance for that money. So hardware of any kind, I think I'll be very excited for, but as long as we get some kind of Mac with an M1X in it, I'm pumped, and the software, of course, is something we all get to use and appreciate for free, so that's a big win. Even if you're not spending money, you get to find out about features and new stuff coming that makes our devices more fun and useful. So what are you guys most excited for out of these leaks? This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you guys in the next one.